They are, this is most of them, um, corn oil, cotton seeds, soybean, safflower, uh, rapeseed oil, peanut oil, canola oil. They're all relatively new. Um, the history of our cooking fats was not seed oils. These are the fats that we cooked with. We cooked with tallow that came from cattle, suet, which is from um, ruminant animals that comes around the organs, uh, lard, which comes from pigs, and butter. These were the main cooking fats in the Western world, really the only cooking fats in the Western world. Um, lard used to be popular. <laughs> And I know that you're kind of thinking, well, what about olive oil? Didn't people cook with that? But when I uh, was researching olive oil for my book, I found out that it actually it is not an ancient food stuff. It was used as a, for medicinal purposes. It was used to anoint the body to make your muscles glisten in battle. But it was not really used for food and cooking until, uh, the, until the 19th century. In Spain, this is, is a reference to in Greece, um, this, what this archaeologist found. But it's also true in Spain and in Italy that there really is not evidence for use as in the culinary sphere until the 1900s. So olive oil was used um, not so much. So uh, what oils used to be used for was, um, as an, was as a lubricant for machinery in the Industrial Revolution. I mean, one of the main reasons that we hunted whales was to get whale oil. It was tremendous. That the oil from whales was the main product that we got from them, and that was used to lubricate the vast and growing amount of machinery that was, uh, that was fueling the Industrial Revolution. When we hunted out all the whales, or most of them, the Americans in the South who were growing cotton, uh, they discovered that cotton seeds, which was a byproduct of their crop, could be crushed into oil, cottonseed oil. A saturated solid fat like butter, which is the top molecule here, you can see that it's a straight molecule. And, that, and, uh, and, that's, and so those molecules stap, they stack on top of each other very neatly, and that's why that is a solid, right? These other molecules, unsaturated fatty acids, um, they're unsaturated because there are many double bonds in them. You can see those double um, like equal signs along the chain there. They're squiggly molecules. They don't stack neatly on top of each other. Therefore, they have a lot of space between them, and that's an oil. So we're talking about unsaturated fatty acids. These are, um, in oils, it turns out that they're very unstable. They, um, they go rancid easily, they degrade over time, and so there was the great invention of being able to use oils uh, was to learn how to hydrogenate them. This was a process that was invented by a German in the early 1900s, and you could see it takes that squiggly molecule and, uh, and through a chemical process that I'll show you in a second, it makes it f it's straight and flat. So you can take an oil and make it, and make it f uh, a straight molecule that allows it to be hardened. It allows it to be a, a hard substance, I mean, a, a, so that all those molecules stack up against each other. This process of hydrogenation turns out to be a rather dramatic one. It involves pressure, heat, hexane, a solvent. It uses a metal catalyst. It has to be steamed to eliminate bad odors. It then has to be bleached to remove the gray color that comes out. When it's gray, it then needs to be winterized for stability and enhanced uh, with artificial colors and synthetic vitamins. It's a pretty extensive process. I've actually been inside of a hydrogenation plant, and it's just a huge, massive operation. But through hydrogenation, these cotton, that cottonseed oil uh, that through Procter and Gamble was the inventor of, of this product, which came, this is the first time that hardened oil came into the food supply as a foodstuff in the form of Crisco. They had, you know, they, they were able to harden this oil. They looked at it. They said, hey, that looks kind of like lard. <laughs> now that we've winterized and deodorized and stabilized it and bleached it, and so let's try to sell it as a foodstuff to people. And they had a huge marketing campaign 
telling women to leave lard, which was dirty and came from the abattoir, the slaughterhouse, and, and instead choose this new fangled fat that came out of clean, sterilized labs and was much more appealing. So margarine was another hydrogenated product, very similar to Crisco. It was meant to replace butter, and it eventually did in large part. And then eventually, we got just plain old cooking oils when they, figure out, they figured out how to do a very light touch form of hydrogenation that allowed for vegetable oils to sit on the shelf and not become rancid. So all of these oils got a huge boost in 1961 when the American Heart Association, really the first organization anywhere in the world, told people to start eating these polyunsaturated oils instead of saturated fats in order as the best measure of prevention against heart disease. It really all started with this recommendation in 1961. Um, it turns out, from my research, I found that the American Heart, Al uh, Heart Association had an alliance with Procter & Gamble, again, the maker of Crisco. Procter & Gamble had, back in 1948, virtually launched the American Heart Association by making it the recipient of um, this radio show called Truth or Consequences and, um, and made it over it, what it'd be today $17 million overnight. So it had a lot of backing from Procter & Gamble, and last time I checked, it still had backing from Procter & Gamble. And this enabled vegetable oils to become like medicine. They were marketed as medicine. And, um, and the vegetable oil manufacturers were very involved in spreading this message. This was a book that was distributed free to thousands of doctors across the United States. This is a Dr. Jerry Stamler, who is a colleague, close colleague of Ansel Keys. It, the whole book, everything in it was sponsored by the Corn Products Company and the Wesson Fund for Medical Research, both vegetable oil manufacturers. If you take just a quick look at, this is polyunsaturated, so this is vegetable oil consumption in the United States from virtually zero, remember we didn't even consume vegetable oils before 1911 with Crisco, up to today where there are 9, 10% of all calories we consume. This almost perfectly uh, parallels the rise in heart disease. So it seems absurd that we should think that this would fight heart disease when our increased consumption is in, in correlates with the rise in heart disease. It certainly didn't seem to prevent it. So what are the sources of these fatty acids in our diet today? Most of them come from, from these vegetable oils. These polyunsaturated fats can also be found in nuts and seeds. They can also be found in chicken quite a bit and, and some pork products, um, depending on how the, the pig is fed. But most of it comes from polyunsaturated vegetable oils. And just if you look at the top chart here, you can see that red line is soybean oil. Most of, the, most of the oil that we consume, in the US at least, is soybean oil. That's what we're consuming. In those clinical trials on saturated fats that um, I was describing and Arnie made reference to, those what we call the core trials, um, in almost all of those trials, what they did is they took you know, they took a regular diet, was, which at the time a regular diet was considered 18% saturated fat, which is very high to us today, but that was considered normal in the 60s and 70s, and they, and they took, so that was the control group. The intervention group in these clinical trials was a group that instead of regular milk, they got soy-filled milk. Instead of regular cheese, they got soy-filled cheese. They got some, their version of the Impossible Burger. So they had much higher content of vegetable oils in their diets. So in effect, those trials can be seen as clinical trials of vegetable oils. You know, what happens when you dramatically increase the content of polyunsaturated fats in, uh, in somebody's diet? So a little known result from those core trials is that in nearly a dozen of them, four of which are listed here, there was higher rates of death from cancer. That's the experimental group. This is from the LA Veterans Study. This was a consistent finding across these trials, higher rates of death from cancer. This was so concerning to the National Institutes of Health that they had, they had a, hosted a series of high-level workshops 
um, at least four that I know of, maybe five, where they brought together top scientists at the time, including Ansel Keys, and they said, what do we do about these, this cancer effect that we are seeing? We can't, you know, we can't just ignore it. Um, and so there was a lot of conversation. I read all the reports that came out of it, and basically their conclusion is, we can't explain it, but it is so important to lower cholesterol. That's our dominant public health message today, to prevent heart disease, so we're just going to basically ignore these cancer results. We think they're of, of secondary importance. Here are some other results that came out of those core clinical trials. In quite a few, there were higher rates of gallstones. Um, there was, in some cases, higher rates of stroke. And in one trial, there was um, possible cirrhosis of the liver. Vegetable oils reliably lower your cholesterol. So what we're seeing here in all of this, the cancer, the gallstones, the strokes, it could be that this is caused by the vegetable oils. It could also be that this is caused by lowering cholesterol. In fact, some of the data I'm showing here show that some of these effects you can get, you see when cholesterol is lowered through drugs, which suggests that it's actually the lowering of cholesterol that uh, has these health effects. Starting in the late 1970s with Mary Enig, an undersung hero who was the first person to find out that uh, or one of the first people who found out that hydrogenated oils, the backbone of Crisco and margarine, that actually they contained trans fats and trans fats were harmful. They caused heart disease. Also Fred Kumaro, who spent his entire career fighting trans fats. Um, and then later in the story came Walter Willett. But um, this led to effectively in the US to a ban on trans fats. I think in, the, in Europe, there's just a, a severe limit on them. But effectively, we, it was no longer possible to use these hydrogenated oils because of this side effect of the trans fats that they produced. Well, what replaced trans fats? You still had this basic problem, which is that oils are unstable. They go rancid, they oxidize. Uh, and so they weren't really, you can't, you can't use, you can't make a shelf-stable product out of them. You can't make cookies if the, you know, the Oreo cookie in the middle is greasy and, and dribbling, <laughs> dribbling on the shelf. That doesn't work. All of those products had hydrogenated oil. So what were food industry manufacturers going to replace them with? Well, they did a number of things. Um, they tried to use genetically modified soybeans in order to create oils that produced um, a lesser amount of the fatty acids that tended to oxidize. They, you, they switched, they started producing more sunflower oil, which also has lower, has, is less um, prone to oxidation. And this is not on this uh, slide, but they started to use a lot of palm oil because that's very high in saturates um, and to some extent coconut oil, but that's more expensive. But in many cases, they just reverted back to using regular old oils. One of the things that I discovered in doing my research was um, that this was a huge problem, especially in food service operations. So, uh, you know, they started just using regular oils in fryers, in restaurants. Um, and this was something, you know, pre previously they had used hydrogenated oils, which were stable. Now they had regular oils. and. Uh, I learned about this from um, somebody who worked, a high level employee of Loader's Crockland, and he told me that when this, this transformation took place, that trans fats were out, regular oils were back in, he said it was a huge problem for like McDonald's and Burger King that the oils were oxidizing and their oxidation products included things like polymers, which is like a paint-like substance, and they were having this, this kind of sticky paint-like substance build up on the walls. They had to get extra strong cleaning solutions to get it off. Just imagine what was happening in the lungs of the workers standing over these fryers. When I say oxidation products, what do I mean? This polyunsaturated oil, so each one of those double bonds, those little equal sign, each one of those can open up and attach to an oxidant. That's oxidation. And then oxidation drives inflammation. So you have these heated oils in restaurants, and they were finding that there were so many oxidation, 
highly unstable oxidation products on the workers' uniforms that when they would take them in their, dry, in their little truck to the dryer, to the laundromat, they would burst into flames in the back of the truck. They would just spontaneously burst into flames. And then even after they had been cleaned in the washing machine, they would burst into flames again in the heat of the dryer. This is just a few of the toxic oxidation products that are produced by heated oils. One very well known, aldehydes. Um, they're actually a former marker for cancer. You actually measure aldehydes to see a level of cancer in somebody's body. They cause these oxidation um, products called rapid cell death. They interfere with your DNA and RNA. Um, and they're implicated in neurodegenerative diseases. Another well-known oxidation product created by oils is acrolein. That's also, uh, you see that from in cigarette smoking, it, in, it causes inflammation, and it, these are known toxins that are products of heated oils. So, and we also know from the experiments of this Dr. Chelany, who works at University of Michigan, when you eat them, they, uh, hundreds of them are absorbed into your body and they pass through the blood-brain barrier. So there's no question that these products enter our bodies. Where to find all these summaries on inflammation and oxidation? Really, the, the main place, I can't believe this, that this still exists, is the original work that I did in my book. It's excerpted by this organization. They have it on their website. You can read it for free. The footnotes aren't there, but if you want to read this whole story, um, you can read it there. I think on cancer, we have evidence from multiple randomized controlled clinical trials that is supported by mechanistic evidence. And so I would say that's decent evidence to show that they, these oils um, are a likely cause of cancer. Heart disease, there's some evidence to support it from randomized controlled clinical trials, such as the Minnesota uh, Coronary Survey. Uh, it is a consistent finding that strokes are lower in people who consume more saturated fat. That's a consistent finding, including in the PURE study, which is the largest observational study in the world. Um, and it's very clear that seed oils cause inflammation through their oxidation. Other health effects, gallstones, could be the vegetable oils, could be the lower cholesterol. Obesity, there is some evidence, there's evidence from three clinical trials that seed oils cause obesity, uh, but those have never been systematically reviewed. Uh, there's at least one mechanistic hypothesis that's been proposed by Michael Eads in his Breckenridge talk. So take away lessons for yourself, for all of us. Avoid these oils if you can. For salad dressings, use olive oil or avocado oil, which are low in the particular type of fatty acids, linoleic or linolenic, that are more prone to oxidation. For cooking, use a stable fat, any of the ones listed there, and avoid fried food in restaurants, sad to say. Or say, I'm allergic to oils, please use butter. Sometimes that works. <laughs>